From the Christian Research Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina, you're listening to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Hank Hanegraaff. We're on the air because life and truth matter. The mission of the Christian Research Institute is to equip believers to answer life's essential questions soundly and persuasively, and to give the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect. For more information, go online to equip.org. And now, here's Bible Answer Man host, Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you very much, Randy. And a reminder that when you become a CRI support team member, you commit to supporting the Christian Research Institute and its many outreach ministries around the world with your ongoing support and appreciation. You receive a personalized copy of any one of my books, personalized to you, a family member or a friend. It's as easy as going to equip.org slash donate. Let's go right to the phone calls. First up is Bob. He's listening in St. Peter's, Missouri. Hi, Bob. Hello. I had a question about the three distinct personalities in the Godhead. I don't see three here. I see God the Father and I see God the Son. But when Joseph was afraid to take Mary as his wife, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, I believe, was in a dream and told him not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife because he said that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is the Father because Jesus was conceived by the Spirit of God, which would naturally make him the Son of God. And so I don't understand the Trinity. It's very confusing. Yeah. If you try what... to look at it as a Trinity, where if you understand that Jesus was the Son of God, making him God, and he was also the Son of Man, making him man, it's very easy to understand it. Well, it isn't easy to understand the mystery of the Incarnation. If you can understand it, you're doing better than any theologian who has ever lived. It's something we apprehend. It is not something that we comprehend. But the very notion of the Holy Spirit as a personal identity is given to us in both Testaments. You think of the words of David, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You look at what happened with respect to Peter saying to Ananias, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God after communicating that he had lied to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has always been communicated not as a force, but a distinct person within the Godhead. And we don't try to be philosophically driven, we seek to be biblically driven. So the fact that I can't comprehend it does not keep me from teaching it. If I believe that the Bible is clearly the Word of God, and this is a clear teaching in Scripture, then I'm happy to teach that. I actually have a little flip chart in which I use the ACTS acronym to give you four ways of remembering that the Holy Spirit is a personal being. That flip chart available through the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. Well, Jesus made that reference when he was talking to the Samaritan lady. But in Acts, the disciples understood this when they were saying to be baptized. They said, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? This was after Peter had preached to them on the day of Pentecost. And he said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the first church understood that and baptized in Jesus' name because they understood that Jesus was eternal God and also fully man. Unfortunately, what you're communicating is a oneness Pentecostal perspective, and I suggest that's probably well, it's what scriptural. you... It's scriptural. Sorry. No, it actually isn't. Oneness Pentecost well, is actually... Well, I just quoted your scripture. That's all I've told you. What well, the Bible says. yes, but you don't even apprehend what the scriptures are are telling you. I'm not apprehending them. If you don't believe what it says, you're going to go down some bad paths. But the point is, is you're being philosophically driven rather than being biblically driven, and that's why oneness Pentecostals call the Trinity pagan polytheistic philosophy. The truth of the matter is that you as a oneness Pentecostal believe that unless you're baptized using the correct formula, you're not truly saved. And that formula, as you allude to, is I baptize you in the name of Jesus, not I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
when Peter says we are to be baptized in actuality, his sense of the name of Jesus, as alluded to in the prologue to your question, Acts chapter 2, or when Jesus says we're to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're not prescribing different formulas. What they're saying is that we have to be baptized by the authority vested in the one true God who has revealed himself to us in Scripture. And therefore, to be baptized in the name of Jesus is to be baptized on the basis of our belief in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The error that begets the error in oneness Pentecostalism is the belief that one must be baptized only in the name of Jesus has led to the further error that Jesus is himself the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to which you again allude. But this is a misapprehension of a very clear teaching of Scripture. So rather than bowing the knee before self-revelation of God, what you've done is you've recast God in a way that you can comprehend. But you're finite, And the finite can never comprehend the infinite. Far better to bow the knee before God's self-revelation. And I think that the real problem with oneness Pentecostalism is the legalistic prescriptions, including the test of rebaptism by your formula, because if you're not speaking in tongues, then you may not be saved. And that places tremendous social psychological pressure on adherents to conjure up the gift of tongues, because those who don't speak in tongues are thought to be lacking in faith or entirely unrepentant. Oneness Pentecostalism was rightly considered a heresy by Pentecostalism when it emerged out of Pentecostalism proper. Why, again, it is taking something that is patently plain in Scripture, and it's recasting or reformulating it. You look at the personal pronouns used in Scripture. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, said Jesus, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And when He comes... He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Or when Jesus says, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. This is not a force. This is not a mode. This is God, the Holy Spirit, guiding you into all truth. For He, said Jesus, will not speak on His own authority, But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Many other examples could be given, but I think the beauty of the Trinity has always been amplified in the Christian church. It has never been minimized. And oneness Pentecostalism comes in in the 20th century as a new idea, capitalizing on an old plague, Sabellianism, and it recasts the beauty of the Trinity, which is something that, again, we can apprehend but not comprehend. When I say God, I mean Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. For the Godhead is neither diffused beyond these, so as to introduce a multitude of gods, nor yet bounded by a smaller compass than these, so as to condemn us for some kind of poverty-stricken consumption of deity, either Judaizing to save the monarchy or falling into Hellenism by the multitude of our gods. I love what the Father said, when I contemplate the three together, I see but one torch and cannot divide or measure out the undivided light. Our thought must be in continuous motion, pursuing now the one, now the three, and returning again to the unity. It must swing ceaselessly between the two poles of the antinomy in order to attain to the contemplation of the sovereign repose of this threefold monad. How can the antinomy of unity and triunity be contained even in an image? 
One of the mistakes that people make is they try to come up with analogies for the Trinity. Some of them are patently ridiculous, like a pie cut into three pieces. Some of them are more sophisticated, like the triple boiling point of water. But the truth of the matter is, all analogies break down when it comes to the Trinity. No illustration sufficiently captures something that cannot be captured, and that is the infinitude of the ineffable, who is unknowable in his essence, only knowable in his energies, and revealed to us by self-revelation, so we can apprehend it alone. In the majestic words of Scripture, we'll be right back with more. Truth Matters, Life Matters More by Hank Hanegraaff is two books in one. Because Truth Matters, Part 1 equips Christians to defend the essential historic truths of the Christian faith. In Part 2, Hank explains why life matters more and how we can experience the height of human existence and purpose, union with God in Christ. Prepare to move beyond intellectually knowing about God to experientially knowing Him in Christ. To receive your copy of Truth Matters, Life Matters More, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us online at equip.org. Don't go anywhere. The Bible Answer Man will return right after this. God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. In Has God Spoken? Memorable Proofs of the Bible's Divine Inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken? from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Equip. Org. Truth Matters, Life Matters More details Hank Hanegraaff's personal pilgrimage from his long defense of truth to his discovery that life matters more. Essentially two books in one, Part 1 equips Christians to defend the essential truths of the historic Christian faith. Part 2 explains why truth is necessary but hardly sufficient. That the map is not the territory, the menu is not the meal, We are created to experience life to the full through union with God in Christ. Is there more to the Christian life than what you are experiencing? Truth Matters, Life Matters More unveils the unexpected beauty of an authentic Christian life. To receive Truth Matters, Life Matters More for yourself or as a terrific gift to a friend or loved one, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit us online at equip.org. Anyone who's been paying attention knows there's a war going on, not just on traditional morality, civility, and decency, but even more fundamentally on historic notions of truth. And the enemy isn't just the onslaught of fake news facilitated by a post-truth culture and turbocharged by growing legions of ideological spin doctors. No, the real enemies of truth range from postmodernist convictions that there is no objective truth to militant scientism that claims that only science Science can determine truth, and religion is little more than primitive superstitions. But CRI support team members are not waving a white flag of surrender. They're holding the fort by undergirding every one of Christian Research Institute's mind-shaping and life-changing outreaches 24-7. To learn how you can make a difference and enjoy all the benefits of support team membership, simply visit equip.org. Hank 
Canagraph has dedicated his life to defending truth because truth matters. However, his life and ministry were radically transformed by another three-word phrase, life matters more. Is there more to the Christian life than what you are experiencing? If so, prepare to discover the unexpected beauty of an authentic Christian life in Hank's magnum opus, Truth Matters, Life Matters More. To receive a copy of Truth Matters, Life Matters More for yourself, or as a terrific gift for a friend or loved one, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI or visit us online at equip.org. And now let's rejoin your host, Hank Hanegraaff. And right back to our calls. Next up is Terry listening in West Virginia. Hi, Terry. You know, I know the Bible speaks about demons and evil spirits where Christ had cast them out of the individual into the pigs and picked them over the cliff and all that, and I'm familiar with that story. But what I don't understand is there's a lot of TV shows on TV now about ghosts about people that have died, like ancient Indian burial grounds, and there's residual spirits, and there's this, and there's that. And I can't find any scripture on it other than the fact that uh, to be out of the body is to be present with the Lord. So what I'm trying to find out, Hank, is do you believe or feel, or is there any scripture that says that some people, when they pass away, maybe are, are stuck here on earth, and, and, and as spirits, they... They haunt the house that they used to live in. We hear so many ghost stories. No, there's no biblical warrant for that whatsoever. I mean, the idea of ghosts or poltergeists, noisy ghosts, is the stuff of mythology, not theology. And you're correct to check out the Bible on this, because you will find exactly what you have just delineated. Absent from the body you're going to either be in the presence of God or absent his loving presence in Hades. Jesus could not have depicted this any more graphically than he did in Luke chapter 16, where he tells of a rich man who dies and he ends up in torment. And Lazarus, the beggar by his gate, dies and he ends up being comforted in Abraham's bosom or paradise, which is a way of talking about being in the presence of God. The rich man wanted Lazarus to be sent back by Father Abraham to warn his five brothers so that they would not come to a place of torment like this. And the enigmatic response was, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe that, they won't believe even if someone appears to them from the dead. So there was no going back from the netherworld, as it were, to the land of the living. Now, uh, obviously, as you also allude to in the prologue to your question, there is such a thing as demons. And demons delight in playing upon the field of our superstitions. And this is the kind of thing that you find in the secular media. Unfortunately, you find it in some Christian media as well. But we unfortunately have become microcosms of the culture rather than change agents of the culture. Another way of putting that is that we're cultural imitators as opposed to being what we ought to be, and that is cultural initiators. So pop culture beckons, and postmodern Christians take the bait. Gotcha. Well, that, that's what I was looking for, a definitive answer, and I appreciate uh, your biblical perspective on that because it means a lot to me. Well, you got it. And as I wrote in my book, Afterlife, necromancy is a devilish deception. What foolishness to feign communication with the dead in the guise of enlightening those who dwell in the land of the living. What does the prophet Isaiah say? When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? And this is one of the hells, if I might say it, of the superstition of ghosts. People are incessantly looking for information of what occurs when we die. That information is already given to us in Scripture. Anything else is a distortion. Not only such, but we should be suspicious 
of anyone who tells us that they know what's going to happen in the future. Because God, in his sovereign love and providence, hides the future from us. I can tell you, if you knew everything that you would face in the future, you wouldn't want to face the future. Because, as Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And the beauty that is implicit in that statement is that when you go through trial and tribulation, God gives you the grace you need when you need it, and oftentimes not a moment before. So when the modern prophetic forecasters tell us that they know what's going to happen when, whether they predict it on the basis of four blood moons or uh, some other event in history, you can happily shrug it off because those prognosticators are wrong every time 100% of the time. They don't know the future. The future is hidden. The only reason God gives us prophecy and fulfillment in the Bible is as he explains, I told you these things before they happened so that when they happened you might believe. It is ratifying that the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament apostles were genuine spokespersons for God. And therefore you can trust their infallible writings. Not so, modern prophecy pundits. Sabrina, next in St. Peter's, Missouri. Hi. Hi, Hank. I just want to thank you for your ministry, Hank. I appreciate your commitment so much to protecting the Word and the truth and how you continually encourage you know, your audience to refer to the Bible, which is God's Word. And so that's I've learned so much from you just in that and how you handle questions. And I just wanted to add one other thing that I totally appreciate also that, you know, you're always just very truthful, and you're a man of truth for that, and um, but you take a, a lot of care in what your audience hears, and I, I think that's just remarkable and wonderful in that. And to my question, I heard recently about a gentleman named Joel Rosenberg and his books on the Epicenter, and I was wondering what your thoughts were about that gentleman. Well, I don't doubt that he is a sincere believer, but I think that his paradigm only allows him to see what his paradigm allows him to see. And so he has a distorted view, I think, of the Scriptures at a seminal point, and that is the notion that God has two distinct people. I would say that that's a seminal point in that the Bible is utterly crystal clear that God has only always had uh, one people. He doesn't replace one people with another people in any epoch of time. He's always only had one people. That people not chosen on the basis of their ethnicity or their station in life or their gender, but because of their belief in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And you see that in the Old Testament with the mixed multitude that leaves Egypt. You see it with Rahab, the Canaanite, Ruth, the Moabite. You see it in the New Testament when Peter shows a bit of racism, and he will not go see Cornelius because he thinks Cornelius is not of the chosen race. And God shows him a vision three times, and Peter, after seeing that vision three times, finally understands. In fact, when he talks to Cornelius, he humbly confesses that it took three times for him to realize that God does not show favoritism. And that's the key word. God does not in any way acknowledge racism or ethnicity. He chooses all those from any nation or people or language that love and fear and reverence and serve him. So whether you're the Ethiopian eunuch or you're Abraham or you're a follower of Jesus Christ in the modern epic, it makes no difference what your gender is, your race your station in life, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are the chosen, that chosen covenant community, beautifully connected by the cross and illustrated by the Apostle Paul through 
uh, cultivated olive tree. So I think the paradigm that God has two separate people and that he's going to replace one people with another people at the end, he's going to replace the church with Israel, the Jews, and then two-thirds of them are going to die in a bloody holocaust is a paradigm that is unseemly, unbiblical, and there's no warrant for supposing that today's modern Jews are going to suffer for their forefathers. Every person suffers for their own sin. So any idea that forwards the notion that God has two distinct people and will replace one with the other is, again, an unseemly, unbiblical idea. And I think that paradigm produces myriad problems. And unfortunately today, the people that are promoting it are not just in the bleachers clapping or shouting, but they're on the playing field helping their paradigms come to fruition. Gonna have to leave it at that. Out of here for today. Look forward to seeing you next time with more of the show. Thank you for listening to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Hank Hanegraaff. In appreciation of your gift to help strengthen and expand the life-changing outreaches of the Christian Research Institute, Hank would like to send you his new book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, The Unexpected Beauty of an Authentic Christian Life. Simply call 888-7000-CRI, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. That's equip.org. You can also write CRI at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28271. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is funded solely by listeners like you. We're on the air because life and truth matter. Has God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. In Has God Spoken?, memorable proofs of the Bible's divine inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken? from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org, equip.org.